Money is just like everything else. Its value depends on its supply, how much there is, and its demand, how much people want it. Governments can create money at any time. Usually, central banks meet every few months to decide whether to adjust the money supply. But if a situation seems urgent, they can ramp things up immediately, as we recently saw during the coronavirus crisis. Bitcoin, on the other hand, doesn't have banks, or boards, or anyone in charge. So how then does it decide how much money to print? Through a process known as halving. Back in 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of Bitcoin, had an idea. What if you took humans out of the financial equation entirely and created new money on a schedule that would last more than 100 years? It would be boring, predictable, and let people trust the system since they could make very long-term plans with confidence and without the need to worry about sudden or unexpected changes. But for Bitcoin to be valuable, it needed to be scarce, like gold. Nakamoto set the maximum number of Bitcoin to 21 million, so Bitcoin would be limited in supply, and thanks to the halvings, it would have a long, predictable, and unchangeable release rate. But how does it work? First, let's explore the process of mining. Think of it like a raffle that has one winner every 10 minutes, where miners generate a new raffle ticket for each math problem they complete and turn in. In the early days, computers weren't optimized to create these tickets, so each Bitcoin miner generated fewer raffle tickets for each contest. Anybody could use their own computer to do it, and many did. Now, in 2020, there are specialized computers to do the mining, and companies that fill enormous warehouses with these machines, in parts of the world where electricity is relatively cheap. And every 10 minutes, one lucky miner wins, and new bitcoins are given to them as the prize. In the early days, when bitcoin had no real value, the protocol gave away 50 bitcoins every 10 minutes. At today's prices, that'd be worth at least $250,000, but back then it was worth less than 50 cents. As time passed, that number went down, with reward halvings every four years. In the first halving, from 50 to 25 in 2012, the price of Bitcoin rose from $2 to about $270. In 2016, it rose to about $700 and kept increasing until the great bubble of 2017 and 2018. The next halving, to 6.25 Bitcoin, may or may not show similar performance. The halving reduces the number of Bitcoin you can win, but the number of raffle tickets entered in each contest has gone up and up. For miners, it's worth playing the game because even as the number of Bitcoin has gone down, their value on the market has risen. So then, the halving is the slow, predictable, long-term process of reducing new Bitcoin given away on the path towards eventually not needing to create any new Bitcoin at all. Over the years, we've seen competition amongst miners go up and up, which attracts even more miners eager for a payday who make the Bitcoin network even more secure. How much higher could the price go after the next halving? Really, there's no telling. Some traders expect big things, maybe six-figure Bitcoin, while others believe the market, long aware of the predictable halving schedule, has already priced this in. Another open question for the decades ahead is whether miners will have enough incentive to keep doing what they do as the every 10 minutes reward keeps tapering off. Remember, miners need to be paid, they're not running these expensive electricity guzzling computers for their health after all. So unless the price of Bitcoin keeps rising, collecting fewer Bitcoins for their work means miners will have to demand ever higher transaction fees from users, and that could make the system more expensive for transferring value. In the end, the halving happens as regularly as clockwork, and whatever the final outcome, it's a fascinating peek into the rules that drive this new economy and one of the most innovative experiments in the world of blockchain today.